We have two members at New Covenant Church who are 96 years old. The younger of the two happens to be a decorated war hero from the Second World War. I am, of course, speaking of John Prescott. Now, my three older children have had an assignment at school, the Living History Project, that requires them to interview someone who is amazing. So they have all naturally interviewed John. And I have been there for all three of those interviews, and I never tire of hearing his life story, his experience in the war, and what followed. It rivals Hacksaw Ridge, saving Private Ryan as far as I am concerned. It is scintillating. The enthusiasm with which he enlisted in the military. The suicide mission to take out the German bunker right there on the top of the hill is this concrete structure. There are the Nazis. John is chosen to lead the charge up the hill to take it. There's no covering. There's nothing. They're all together exposed to gunfire. And then at the last minute, the white flag emerges from the top of the hill. John's life is spared. In a firefight where he is literally blown up and left somewhere between life and death. And in that state, he hears the voice of a friend calling from the middle of the street, one who had also been injured, and John crawls over to him and helps him to receive medical care. When I talk with John, I feel a little bit like a snowflake, a little wimpy. And and it's not because of him, I can assure you. John is always kind and encouraging, but there is, shall we say, a conspicuous difference between the two of us. So I'm with my son, Philip, the other day, and we're driving home, we're we're talking about Mr. Prescott, and I asked this question, what's the difference? What's the difference between the greatest generation of which he is part and most of us today? Philip offered an answer that I think is helpful. He said, it seems to me they pursued a purpose that is bigger than themselves a mission that exceeded their own personal desires. When he said that, I immediately thought about this preaching series, The Resurrection Changes Everything, because one of the ways in which it changes life is it gives us purpose. It gives us something for which we can live and die, something greater than ourselves, indeed, a battle. We are enlisted as children of light, called to confront the forces of darkness in this world. And so this morning, I want to think with you about this question. How can we give ourselves more fully to our calling? In other words, how can we fight the good fight? For the answer, we'll look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 11. Paul the Apostle is writing to his young protege, Timothy, who at this time is in Ephesus. And his words apply directly to the young leader, the shepherd, but by extension they also apply to us, for we are grounded in Christ. We are men and women who share in this same mission. So we begin at verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy is called the man of God. And he is exhorted here to remember his confession. This is an interesting phrase. Uh, It is, in fact, the only place in the New Testament where we find such a designation, man of God. It appears quite a lot in the Old Testament, over 70 times. Mostly of the prophets, it's use of David as well. But we see it uh, in the book of 1st and and 2nd Kings, especially of Elijah and Elisha. And there we we get a sense that it's, it's describing a person who pursues a purpose greater than himself. It is underscored here by Paul with 
a strong adversative. But as for you, unlike those other people, Timothy, the false teachers in Ephesus, most of the population there, even in the church, you are to be different. You are to be countercultural, a man after God's own heart. Well, what does this look like? How does it uh, take shape in the course of one's life and ministry? Well, there are two behaviors that Paul gives us, fleeing and pursuing. First, fleeing. It's the word fugo. It means to resist, to avoid, to escape. Think of Joseph fleeing Potiphar's wife. There she is. Danger, danger. She's coming after him. He must flee. This kind of temptation comes at God's people all the time. We're constantly assaulted. And it's not just external either. It's not represented only by this person or this situation. But as we know all too well, it comes from within. It comes from our own fallen and broken hearts. This uh, past week, I was throwing the football around with my daughter, Eliza, and uh, out on the sidewalk was my son, Malachi, and my nephew, Maddox, and they're riding their bicycles. Maddox is very precocious. He's five years old, and he's very loud. And uh, he's riding his bicycle with a stick in his hand, which I think was supposed to be a sword, and he is yelling, let's get the bad guys! Let's get the bad guys! Over and over. And so finally, I thought, this is an opportunity that I can't miss, so I I walk over. I say, Maddox, come over here. And I get down to his level. And I say, listen, I need to tell you something. We're all bad guys. See Malachi there? He's a bad guy. And I'm a bad guy. Even Auntie Angie is a bad guy. Now I'm just messing with his categories. He doesn't know what to think. But Jesus died to make us good guys, to forgive us, and to give us his spirit to renew us from within so that we're more and more like him, the ultimate good guy. It was about 15 minutes later, I overheard him saying to Malachi, Jesus is making us good guys. I said, that's right. That's exactly right. Well, that's the reality of life. We are saints, yes, but we are also sinners, right? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Some of our biggest problems emerge from within, don't they? Idolatry, youthful desires, selfish gain. These are the things Paul tells us we must flee from. How exactly do we do it? Well, John Stott is helpful. He writes, the apostle gives no techniques. He doesn't tell us how to attain holiness. We are simply to run from evil as we run from danger. We flee. But it's not simply fleeing. We're also to pursue. What is it we pursue? Well, the apostle gives these virtues, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. What is righteousness anyhow? Well, it's a redeeming grace that first comes to us. It provides us with God's favor. We sinners, we who rebel against him, we are forgiven. We are justified. But it doesn't stop there. That righteousness also works within our souls. We are made more like God in the way we think, in the way we speak, in the way we relate to others. And then finally, that righteousness extends through us into the world. We become the hands of the the merciful one who bring hope and healing to a fallen world. And there's godliness. This is a posture of reverence. It is a Godward vision. The Lord, who is high and exalted, He's the reference point, you see, for our lives, not ourselves. And there is faith, active trust, dependence, reliance upon God. These are the open hands with which we receive God's promise, His blessing. And there's love, agape. A desire to sacrifice for someone else. Have you ever had that experience of of feeling a burden to help another person, to serve someone? 
God gives, God deposits that into our hearts, right? Romans 5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Steadfastness. It is looking beyond our own needs to the needs of others, and it is doing it with endurance, even amid opposition. There are some times when we just want to quit. Over the last two years, many of us have have been in this place, I can't carry on. I know you've called me to serve. I just don't have the resources to persevere. The Lord provides those resources. Philippians 3.14, Paul again, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then gentleness, also translated meekness. This was a loathsome quality. Uh, in the ancient world. Even Aristotle, for all his talk about ethics and, and virtue, was rather explicit that you know, it's fine for a woman to be meek or for a child, but not a man. That's considered a flaw. That's a liability. But Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is what we pursue together this fleeing and pursuing constitute the battle to which we are called. So, verse 12a, fight the good fight of the faith, Paul says. It's the verb agonizomai. You can hear the word agony right there. Uh, It's a struggle. It's a strain. It doesn't come easy. We need to strive. It's a favorite term of Paul's when he describes his calling. 1 Corinthians 9.29, Colossians 1.28. In short, it's a fight. It's a battle. We're in over our heads. We, we don't have the requisite insight we need. And yet, in our weakness, what happens? We find God's strength made perfect. I love that scene from the film Master and Commander. Maybe you've seen it. features Russell Crowe. He plays Captain Jack, who engages Napoleon's dreaded warship. So there they are chasing one another across the high seas. And finally, um, Jack's uh, ship catches up, disables the, the sails of the French vessel, and then an assault team hacks their way down into the hold. And there in the brig, they find some English soldiers who had been captured uh, from other ships. And as they liberate the English soldiers, they immediately hand them swords, and those men spring into action. That's our story, you see. We were in bondage to sin, to death. We were without hope. But Jesus, through his death and resurrection, liberated us. He set us free. And as soon as we were liberated, he handed us the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with which you and I fight this good fight. C.S. Lewis writes, Enemy-occupied territory, that is what the world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in his great campaign of sabotage. You feel like you're in a war? You should. Because we are. This is the good fight. 2 Corinthians 10.4 The weapons with which we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So when we engage in this battle, who do we fight against? That's an important question to ask. Well, it is not other people. It is first and foremost ourselves, right? taking every thought captive, subduing our own bodies, uh, confronting ourselves so that the thoughts we think and the affections that we exercise are in keeping with God's truth. And then when we are in that place of walking in the Spirit, we embody that truth, that mercy into the world. And from that engagement comes liberation. Well, what's the objective, the overall goal of this battle? Paul continues in verse 12b, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
Paul commands Timothy to never settle for a second-hand faith. Remember that day, Timothy, when you came to Christ and you received this calling. This arena has no spectators. No, he's called to actively grab hold of life, to grasp it. The word epilambano means to forcefully take hold of something. And what is the thing he is to grasp? Eternal life. Very often when we hear that term, we think of everlasting life. And it is that, that in Christ we enjoy the presence of God forever and ever and ever. But it's not simply duration. It also describes a quality of life. Now, you and I, seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, enjoy a capacity to live that we never had before joining the new creation. And so we have this gift, and with it comes a responsibility. Sometimes couples renew their wedding vows when they arrive at major milestones So Paul here ignites Timothy's heart by evoking the memory of his baptism and the confession of faith that he gave before the church. Do you remember that moment, Timothy? Remember having come to Jesus, you stood before the assembly of God's people and you made that full-throated confession, Jesus Christ is Lord, and that you would live for him, that you would take up your cross and follow him. Well, now is the time to live out that confession. Being aware of our human weakness, Paul knows that such appeals are short-lived and therefore must be undergirded by a deep motivation, which is precisely where he goes next. This is the second reminder, beginning at verse 13. He writes, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever. So what are we to remember here? The reason for our confidence, this breathtaking description of who God is and what he has done, Paul upholds Jesus as the model that we are to follow. Now we're rightfully cautious Uh, When we hear Jesus described as a model, you know, as an example to emulate. This, of course, is the history of theological liberalism. This is Friedrich Schleimacher who said, well, it's not important whether Jesus lived. The whole idea of him being born of a virgin and uh, risen from the dead. What matters is the example, you see, that he gave us. So with that inspiring example, we can be better people. That's more or less the idea. Um, That's unacceptable. That's another Jesus. That's another gospel. It gives us, as Niebuhr put it, a God without wrath, bringing people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. Jesus is more than an example. But listen, he's no less than that. And so it is appropriate for us to read through the Gospels, for example, and see the life of Jesus and recognize that what he does there informs the way we are to live. We remember him at the Garden of Gethsemane with sweat pouring from his face like drops of blood. We pray to the Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's instructive. That kind of devotion, that's where we live, isn't it? or before the Jewish soldiers when they came to apprehend him. You have come for me, therefore let them go. And we remember Jesus before Pilate. Pilate, the Roman governor who had the power, at least on a horizontal level, to decide whether Jesus would live or die. Here's what we read in John 18, 37. 
You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on on the side of truth, Jesus said to Pilate, listens to me. Wow, what courage. This was Jesus' confession. And so Paul, having invoked that divine witness, admonishes Timothy to fulfill his calling. In light of what Jesus has done, think about who you are and how you are to live in this moment, Timothy. Throughout the duration of his life, Timothy is to serve, Paul says, without spot or blame, that is, without compromise. Or again, he is an enlisted man. He is to obey. He is to fight. He is to courageously engage each day in the name of Christ. And for how long does this service last? Forever. To the end. Until the appearing of Jesus. That is, his return when he makes all things new. There's no retirement. You know, we might disengage from work. That's fine. You get to a certain age, you need a change. But the whole idea of us no longer fighting the good fight no longer presenting ourselves for service, is completely foreign to the teaching of the New Testament. Um, It's who we are, you see, right? Acts 1, Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses. Our ministry isn't just an activity. It grows out of our identity. We are children of light who advance Christ's kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, why can we have hope? Uh, It's a daunting call. And so where do we find the audacity to lift our heads from our pillows and engage this battle each and every day? The reason is because Christ is victorious. He has already won the victory on our behalf. And we have the great privilege of walking in that victory. We go from strength to strength, you see, Um, The the ultimate outcome has been decided in the person of Jesus, our Savior who hung upon the cross and who was raised from the dead. It's an interesting word that's used here. It's actually a loaded term that comes from uh, the history of the Greek military. It's the word epiphaneos. You can hear the English word epiphany there, appearing. And it was commonly used of Caesar Augustus, the, uh, the emperor. Uh, he, of course, brought an end to the, uh, the civil wars. He brought the, the peace, the Pax Romana. And uh, it was common for Augustus to be described as the one who brings the Epiphaneos, right? his appearing. He was also called Lord, Kurios, and Savior, Soter. And so what Paul's doing here is he's using the terminology of the empire, those designations commonly employed for Caesar, and now he's using it of Jesus. This would have had great significance to the people in Ephesus, hearing this term. In other words, Paul is pointing to Christ as the true sop. To make this point, the apostle highlights four divine attributes. Again, the only sovereign. In other words, God is in control. Not Caesar, not the politicians, not the elites who are are holding the levers of power. Boy, this is a message we need for today. (laughs) It doesn't come down to politics. It comes down to the true sovereign, the only real sovereign. Second, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the supreme ruler. Everyone else is an imitation. The Lord's rule is the reality of which every other rule is simply a parody. Who alone is immortal. Third, God doesn't change. He's always the same. He is incorruptible. Although Roman emperors claimed immortality for themselves, Paul shoots that clay pigeon right out of the sky. There's only one who is immortal. And then finally, the one who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. This describes the holy habitation of the Lord. Think of Isaiah 6. 
Think of the Lord high and exalted. Right? That's the vision. Or in the words of Psalm 104 too, the Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. Knowing these truths, knowing who God is, provides us with the requisite courage to arise each day and engage the battle. Again, I'll quote Stott. He says, Our confidence in God's perfect timing and our consequent willingness to leave things in His hands arise from the kind of God we know Him to be. And here's the amazing thing. This is the God that we call Father. There are some days when we just can't lift our heads from our pillows, much less engage the battle that rages in the world. How do we do it? This is how we do it. The realization of who God is. The sovereign one. The king of kings and lord of lords who alone is incorruptible. Well, we might expect Paul to end his letter here, but he doesn't. He proceeds to issue a practical admonition to the rich. Verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Timothy, tell the wealthy among you not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in their wealth, to trust in the Lord, to realize He is the source of every good and perfect gift. That's where it comes from. Not from their bank account. It comes from above, from the Father of lights. Wealth, after all, is fleeting. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Circumstances change. It's not the sh sure foundation that we think it is. Tom Wright says, not only can you not take it with you when you go, but you can't be sure you're going to keep it while you're here. In a world increasingly dominated by money, it seems almost indecent to even mention. But the New Testament, in its eminent practicality, reminds us of facts our culture wants us to forget. Money comes and goes. God, however, does not. Now, I don't know how much money you give to New Covenant, just to be clear. I've never known, and I don't plan to ever know. Uh, I think we have a treasurer. There's one person. I'm not even sure who the treasurer is. You're learning things about your pastor here. That's good leadership. You don't have to be on top of every detail. We have good people here. Um, but here's the thing I want to say about money. If you want to know your priorities... If you want to know what your functional gods are, it's really quite simple. Look at your checkbook. We, we invest in the things we care about the most. It's a truism. And so uh, our giving, our stewardship, our service in this area is an important indicator of our heart. Christian life is a matter of stewardship. Again, verse 18 they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. So many examples. I think sometimes when pastors talk about money, it can have a negative ring to it. But the truth of the matter is that as a pastor, I have a front row seat to amazing generosity. I have congregants who will approach me, congregants who have wealth, and say, you know, it looks like so-and-so is struggling. I heard that... Uh, he or she is struggling to pay the rent. Why don't you give this gift to them anonymously? Um, I understand that this missionary is trying to get on the field and they're not quite there. Um, I want to help. How about I, I host a dessert in my house and I invite my friends? That's what it looks like and it happens all the time. Right? Helping people. That is what lasts, not the stuff, not our, our achievements when it's all said and done. That's what endures. Isn't that right? You go, to a, you go to a funeral, and what do you hear people talk about? The relationships. 
I told this story years ago when I was a pastor at College Church. I did a funeral for someone who had like the world's biggest train collection. You go into the basement of their mansion and it was just like trains, you know, through the mountainside with little tunnels and the, it was amazing. And then this person died. He seldom went to church. His wife was the one who came and was active in ministry. And it was the saddest thing in the world because as people talked about him, all they talked about were the trains, you know, the, the long railways and the, the unique hats that he would wear and so forth. Now contrast that with the kind of funeral when you gather around to remember a great saint, huh? someone who has given their life for Christ, someone who's made a difference, someone who has invested in the spreading of the gospel that has brought eternal transformation. That's what matters. That's what Paul is calling us to. Lives transformed by the power of the gospel. That's what we're trying to say. In short, Paul is telling us faithful stewardship is how we store up treasure for the future. That is the way we grasp true life. And that leads then to the fourth truth we must remember. We must remember to guard the deposit. Verse 20. O oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. This phrase, guard the deposit, is a banking term. It describes a procedure that was common in the Greek and Roman and Jewish societies in which uh, Paul lived. And it involved transferring a commodity to an authorized person. So in 2 Timothy 1, verse 14, Paul says, by the Holy Spirit, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And what is the deposit? What is this, uh, this treasure that Paul was to guard and to pass on? It is the message of Christ. It is the sound words. It is the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection and the new age which has begun. Again, 2 Timothy 2, just a few verses later, Paul says, what you have received, this faith, you are to pass on to faithful men. That's how it works. Uh, it's a sacred trust. He conveys this as well in 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance, this is the priority you see, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that this enterprise of passing on the faith was attacked by these false teachers. Who were these people, anyhow? These individuals in Ephesus who were undermining the gospel. Well, we don't know for sure. Paul doesn't identify them explicitly. He says they were spreading, quote, irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. When I studied this uh, during seminary, it was called an incipient Gnosticism. That sounds nasty, doesn't it? You don't want any part of that action. What is Gnosticism? Well, it's a, a system of thought that came into its own in the second century, which believed in, in sort of Greek Platonic fashion. All matter is evil. It's fallen. It's wicked. What matters is the spirit. And the way you escape evil matter and access uh, spiritual life is through some secret knowledge, right? some mysterious uh, incantation or something of that nature. It would seem as if that was beginning to spread, and that's the, the, the significance of the word incipient. It is, it is starting. It has initiated. The constituent elements of what would become Gnosticism are already there on the ground in Ephesus. And Paul says, we mustn't let this confusion undermine our message. We can't let it cloud and obscure the message of the gospel. The second person plural has the entire church in view. Uh, you all, men and women who follow Christ, you are to guard the deposit. Now that's noteworthy. Uh, all along, Paul has been speaking directly to Timothy, but now he broadens his address, uh, perhaps anticipating that this letter would be read in the Ephesian church. This is the calling with which we are all called. Uh, 
Now, we don't believe in apostolic succession, as in a clerical office of priests who mediate sanctifying grace, passed on from the apostles right through time. But we do believe in apostolic succession as it relates to the message, you see. The message of the gospel has been passed on from the written word from one generation to another. And that's what we have received. And it's a sacred trust. That's the point. We are called to protect it, to preserve it, to promote it, and to ensure that it gets passed on to subsequent generations. Elders of the church, we must keep the side up. We must promote fidelity. We must be present to listen, not to, to be inquisitors, not to be overly tedious and doctrinaire and, and that kind of thing, but just to be attentive and engaged to ensure that this faith is taught with Christ at the very center. And all of us have this calling, once again, to pass on the faith in the context of our friendships, in our families, and uh, among those whom we are discipling. This is how we guard the deposit of faith. Well, as we close, I want to consider one final thing. I want to think about the heartbeat that animates this calling where we find the necessary uh, inspiration and unction to enter the battle each day. I'll do so by sharing an illustration. In 1993, a small elite force was sent into Mogadishu, Somalia, to capture some chieftains who were terrorizing the people. You may remember this, early 90s. Uh, the government there in Somalia had been overthrown, and there were some warlords who had the guns and the money and the drugs. And meanwhile, most of the population was starving to death. The, the images are just haunting. And so the U.S. military was sent there in order to, to bring peace and to provide. Uh, during the operation, two Black Hawk helicopters were shot down. Normally, they would go on these operations at night, but they got a tip that two of the top chieftains were going to be meeting, I think, at a hotel during the day. And so they seized the opportunity to go. Well, those uh, helicopters, two of them at least, were shot down. Suddenly, a mission that was supposed to last less than an hour became an overnight firefight, with U.S. troops surrounded by thousands of Somali soldiers. The details are recorded in the book Black Hawk Down, which, as you may know, later became a movie by the same title. 24-year-old Army Ranger Sergeant Jeff Struker led the three-vehicle convoy that returned multiple times to the battle zone to rescue soldiers. The first U.S. fatality occurred in Struker's Humvee. Miraculously, though, he led the column of vehicles out of the city and into the safety of the military base. If you've seen the movie, you know this is just a riveting segment. You're watching it thinking, there's no way they're going to make it. Uh, their bullets are flying from everywhere. The tires get shot out. Somehow, Sergeant Struker was able to find his way out, uh, leading the other vehicles as well. Upon arrival at the base, Struker was informed that men were still trapped in the city and he would have to drive back into the pandemonium. A Delta Force member explained that he'd have to wash the blood out of the back of his vehicle before returning to pick up the men forcing them to sit in the blood of their friend would have been too traumatic. Struker would later recount that the experience led to a moment of panic. As he washed his friend's blood from his vehicle, he kept thinking, this will be my blood. This will be my blood. And at once, he was frozen in fear. He then paused and he prayed. While praying, the thought occurred to him, God determines whether I live or I die. He has all of my days numbered. If he chooses to let me live this day, I will go home to my wife. If I die, I will go to my heavenly home and be with Jesus. Either way, I'm going home. Suddenly, a peace settled upon him. He jumped into the driver's seat, returned to the city, and saved more men. 
Then he did it again and again and again. How is this possible? How does a man possibly step out from the paralyzing fear into his Humvee and drive directly into a firefight of unimaginable proportions? In other words, how is Jeff Struker willing to lay down his life for others? The answer is, his heart was captured by Jesus, the Savior who entered into the crucible of death on our behalf. The one who stretched out his arms and shed his blood, receiving nails of divine judgment on our behalf so that we could be forgiven and set free. Sergeant Struker remembered the lessons of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Once again, remember our commission, who we are in Christ, and how we are called to live. Remember the sovereignty of God, that He directs all of our steps and maintains perfect control. Remember what is truly life. So much of what concerns us is, is of little significance compared with the ultimate calling of bringing people closer to Jesus. And finally, remember to guard the deposit of faith. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, there are no words to describe our wonder as we consider the sacrifice that you made for us. We thank you for the love, for the commitment, and for the mercy that captures our hearts and doesn't simply make us your children, but commissions us to now represent you. Oh, would you help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to arise each day and like Isaiah of old, to say, O oh Lord, here am I. Send me. Amen.